Now, one of the first indications, how many of you put Christmas lights on your house? How many of you don't put Christmas lights on your house? We're not judging you. We're not calling you names. We're just Now, you that put lights on the house, how many of you are going all in? You try to do that? Some of you try to do that. I've seen that in Mound City in Pleasanton. There's a contest going on for best Christmas decoration. So good luck to you that go all in. And there's so many choices. There's, it seems like every year they come out with new choices. Was it just last year they came out with these crazy shine the lights on the house and uh, thing. And it's like, where did that come from? Who thought of that? And that's a great idea. Um, so they've got light. I mean, the trees, they're on houses and buildings and tables and windows. There's Christmas lights all over. There's a lot of choices, your basic string lights and there's icicle lights, and rope lights, blinking lights, chaser lights. Anybody still have these on their tree? Do they still work at your house? Uh Oh, I see a few. Okay, I will withhold any jokes I had lined up for those since there's some of you have those. Anyway, uh, you know, using lights at Christmas isn't because it's dark longer, right? We're not putting it out because, hey, it gets dark, you know, at five o'clock. We're putting them out because the light of the world has come into the world. And we are celebrating Jesus as the light of the world. How cool is it? The first words spoken by God. Do you remember what they are in the Bible? What were the first words God spoke in the Bible? Let there be light. So how cool is it that when Jesus came, he said, I'm the light of the world. And that, you know, the angels are out there and a bright light and the star and angel showed up and the star over the place. By the way, yesterday we had a group go up to watch that animated movie, The Star. And uh, that was really a fun movie. I encourage you to go. It seems biblically accurate. It's told from the perspective of the animals and a lot of fun. Over a hundred of us uh, went into one of the theaters that was reserved for us and uh, a great time there, the star. So I recommend that uh, to you if you get a chance to check into that. No matter what you do in a room, you can't do anything in that room until you first turn on the light. The reality is that the world is a dark place. And we're never going to find our way. We're never going to see reality accurately until the light of Christ is shining in our world. So I want us to look at one of the prophecies in Isaiah chapter 9. And it deals with light in a big way. Starting in verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And afterward, more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea and beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. Now, it's written hundreds of years before, and it starts telling us about Galilee. And then it says this, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them, a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. As in the day of Midian for every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. To order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. 
Now it begins in verse, the key phrase there is in verse two. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. So the clear teaching there is that we live in a world of darkness. There was darkness there until the light came. Matthew, interestingly, quotes from Isaiah 9 and applies it to Christ. So we don't have any doubt that this is talking about Christ. It's in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. I want to read the text to you because it's applied to Christ. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region, in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, Matthew applies those very scriptures and says Jesus is the fulfillment right down to the region of the country that he came from. Uh, one, in John chapter 1, Jesus met up with a future disciple and he heard he was from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth, he said. But it also says in John chapter 1 that this was the true light which gives light to every man. And he was coming into the world and he was in the world and the world was made through him. But the world did not know him. The world did not know him. We live in a very dark world and we could describe the darkness of the world in two different ways. We could say that the darkness of the world is evil and ignorance. There's evil and there's ignorance in the world that contribute to the darkness. When you think of the evil side of things, we have a little expression that we sometimes will say, uh, he crossed over to the dark side. Or everybody has a dark side. Or that's just my dark side. I don't like to you know, show that or reveal that or expose that. When it comes to ignorance, we say, man, I'm just in the dark about that. I have no idea. Dark. The world is filled with evil and untold suffering. Think of the dark environment when Jesus was born. Think of what was happening. Herod sent his soldiers to kill all the little babies. There was an oppressive Roman government in which crucifixions were a normal part of, the li of life. Families were ripped apart by Herod's cruel command and refugees were fleeing. And sounds kind of similar to our world today. Every day brings news of violence, whether it's on a criminal level, a terrorist level, a national level. Um, I was fascinated to learn just this week that in Myanmar and Bangladesh, two remote parts of the world that we never think about, there's been a flood of refugees fleeing persecution. Just since August, 600,000 people have gone from Myanmar to Bangladesh. 600,000, 25% of the population of Kansas has moved just since August. Um, our missionary friends in Honduras have had some political upheaval this week. Last Sunday was an election in Honduras and the uh, election is in dispute. The contender uh, has accused the incumbent of fraud. The incumbent was supposed to announce the results of the election Thursday night and they haven't done that yet. And um, they've canceled, they canceled school all week for at the international school where the missionary kids attend. And uh, be praying for Miguel and Christy Lopez and their family. He says they have plenty of food and water at their house, but they're just hunkered down. And, and uh, the protests in the streets have turned a little more violent in the last couple of days. Um, all over where we look, it's a dark kind of world. Um, Man, when you look at a culture that objectifies women the way our culture does um, in movies, television, the media, it's no wonder that these sexual harassment charges have been coming out the way they have. It just makes, um, it just adds to the darkness. It just confirms what we already know, um, the darkness. Interesting note, by the way, the same culture that uh, has been showing us how perverse 
uh, some men are and corrupt some men are also wants to uh, allow so-called transgender men into women's restrooms and such. It's a very convoluted and incoherent uh, culture in which we live. But there's also an ignorance that people in the dark don't know how to solve the issues of the dark. You see, people look at our culture and they say, yes, this is broken and we can fix it. We know how to straighten this out. We can take care of things. I was fascinated to read a book review this week uh, written by what they described uh, as one of the most prominent journalists over the last 50 years. She's been retired about five years and wrote her memoirs. And the memoirs were full of all of the men that she had been involved with, all of the uh, occultic devil-worshipping practices that she had been involved with. And she was called one of the most influential female journalists. Take a look at, if you're in Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 19. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. It's fascinating. Our culture, the places they go, And the experts that people check in with trying to make sense of and solve the darkness that they so readily acknowledge is there. The next two verses, verse 21. They will pass through it hard pressed and hungry. And it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish. And they will be driven into darkness. What a description of our culture. That looks out at the darkness of the world and says, I'm going to look up and curse God if there is one out there. And then look all around and all we find are people desperate and hungry to somehow find worth and value and dignity and meaning and satisfaction and identity. Look at the lengths people are going to to try to find identity in our culture today. And all the while, the light is shining. And they look to the earth and human resources to fix their world. And they look to experts and mystics and scholars to find solutions. Yes, they say, we're in darkness, but we can fix it ourselves. So some look to the state, to the government to solve problems. And some look to science and technology. And some look to the markets to solve problems. And we have all these different solutions that are proposed. But they all have the same assumption. We're in the dark and we can fix it. Just look within yourself. You have it in you. We can fix it. If we just apply our intellect And our ingenuity, we can solve the problems of mankind. Now, some inventions have truly made life better. You're never going to hear me complain about indoor plumbing. I think that is a tremendous, tremendous invention. And I like my smartphone a lot. But how many would think that Smartphone technology has made life easier and less complicated. How many think it's maybe made things a little more complicated? Here's the thing. When you have science without morals, you have something like the Holocaust. You see, science can invent nuclear energy And they can come up with good ways to apply nuclear energy and make electricity. And they can come up up with some evil ways to use nuclear energy. With the technology that's come along, um, 
some recent figures related to pornography because pornography has become so much more accessible. The percentages of men and women that are viewing pornography are staggering. But I will say this. Since 2015, if you add up the amount of time that people have have spent viewing pornography just since 2015, it equals over a million years. The porn industry is worth $97 billion. It's a number. If you add up all of NFL, Major League Baseball, and the NBA, the Basketball League, combined, they are not worth what the pornography industry is worth. The average child begins viewing pornography at 10. The reality of Christmas is that there's only one hope for the darkness that's in this world. And that's the light of Jesus Christ. Anything else is consulting wizards and whatever. We're trying to solve it ourselves. Only digs the hole deeper. Only compounds the ignorance or the evil. Christmas is not saying, let's all cheer up. If we just pull together, think what we can accomplish. We're all happy. It's Christmas. Christmas isn't for optimists that say, if we just cheer up, look what we can accomplish. It's not for pessimists that say, It's just a dark world and there's no hope. There's dystopia dystopia ahead for all of us. Christianity says, this is bad. This is really bad. And there's hope. There is darkness and there is a light. The people who have been walking in darkness have had a light presented to them. So in John 8 and verse 12, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What he was trying to say to humanity was, there's only one way out of this. You can look other places. You can look other ways. But there's only one source of hope. And that's the light that flashed onto the scene. You that get up and maybe start for work before the sun comes up. Just begins to get a little bit of light and a little bit more light. And before long, you're putting your sunglasses on because it's fully light out. What does sunlight bring? One thing sunlight brings is life. It brings life. Plants need it to thrive and to grow. You know, if the sun went out, we would all freeze. The planet Mercury, the temperature on the planet Mercury is 800 degrees Fahrenheit on one side and minus 300 degrees on the other side. It's fascinating how God put the earth at the perfect distance and the perfect tilt from the sun. The perfect rotation. The planet Jupiter, which is the largest planet, spins in 10 hours. It does a complete uh, rotation, 10 hours. But because of the speed with which it's spinning, the atmosphere is in constant turmoil and constant storms are on Jupiter. The Earth spins at the perfect speed. The perfect distance from the sun. Acts chapter 17 lets us know that it's only because of God. In him we live and move and have our being. Even as one of the prophets have said, we're all his offspring. We're all made by God. And so not only does the son give life, so does the son. And we studied a couple of weeks ago about the life and the freedom that comes when we know the Son of God. 
The sun also brings truth. It shines the light of day, right? If you're driving your car at night, you can't go anywhere without your headlights on. Light reveals. You can't do anything in a room till the light's on. You want to keep your flashlight handy if you're out in the dark, you're rummaging through the house. And the scripture reminds us that truth is, again, only from God. It's in 1 John 1 and verse 5 and 6. This is the message that we have heard of him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie And do not practice the truth. It ties in light and truth there directly. The sun also brings us beauty. All the shades of green. Flowers, sunrises and sunsets. You know, in places where there's only a few hours of sunlight, there's higher levels of depression. Right? There's something about sunlight. There's even a name for it, I think. Wintertime and the blues when you're kind of down. Because the sun gives energy and vitality and life and beauty. And God is that kind of light. It's fascinating, these comparisons. God alone has the life and the truth and the joy that we lack and no amount of human effort or ingenuity or resources or brains or intelligence or technology can create what God can give. No amount can bring peace to the human heart. It's only in Christ. And so he's described in verse six, take a look at how he's described unto us. A child is born unto us. A son is given The government will be upon his shoulders. The responsibility will be on him and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. He has the wisdom to speak truth and grace into our lives. He's never at a loss for words. His guidance is always consistent, coherent and wise. His commands are protecting us from anything bad and providing for us anything good. His wisdom is seen in his great words of Jesus. Lose your life and you will save it. Give and you will receive. Serve and you will be exalted. The wisdom of our wonderful counselor. Mighty God. We often get the impression that Jesus is some kind of softy, some kind of wimp. Kind of moping around all the time. Have you ever seen a carpenter's hands? My dad was a carpenter long before I was born and continues to pound nails. So I remember sitting in church next to him as a little boy and I'd be looking over his hands. Because they were so thick and rugged. And I loved sitting there looking at his hands until we would get home and I had misbehaved at church. (laughs) And those hands applied a great many lessons. And so I have personal interaction with a carpenter's hands. There was nothing soft about them. Jesus demonstrated his power by calming storms Multiplying bread, turning water into wine, casting demons out of people. The mighty God longs for a relationship with humanity. The mighty God isn't looking to be harsh and mean and cruel. and He's not looking to blast you. He wants to bring the light so that you know what life and truth are really about. Everlasting Father. What a great name, description of Christ. Eternity past, eternity future, he always has been. 
his entrance into the world. It was a birth, a human birth. And so from human terms, we speak about it as, uh, well, he was born. That was the birth of Christ. But in reality, he became. In John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That wasn't his origin back there in Bethlehem. That was just a transition from his eternity past to the limitations of a physical body. He lived long before he was born. The last one is Prince of Peace. Our world longs for peace. There's an organization in New York City devoted to trying to help the world find peace. So many of your prayers this week for, were for peace in your life. The world craves it between countries, within communities, within families. But the need is in hearts, individuals. And there's only one chance for that. There's only one source of that kind of peace. So many efforts. But none of them can affect or change a human heart. It's only God who has that capacity. It's only Christ who has that capacity to change a human heart. Now, how does the light the Son, the Savior, become ours. Take a look at verse 6 again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. If you mark in your Bible at all, you might mark that word given. It's a gift. It comes to us as a gift. It's yours only if you're willing to receive the gift, it's called grace. That means you're treated far better than you deserve. Now, verse five creates some warrior imagery. Look at verse five. Every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. You know what the imagery is saying there? It's saying all of your efforts to win the battles for yourself don't have to be done anymore. You might as well burn all of your warrior clothes, all of your efforts, all of the battles you've been fighting yourself. We don't need a warrior's boots or sandals. We don't need warrior garments. We don't need a sword. Because someone else has already fought the battle. And his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Right before those great names of Christ, it says the government, the responsibility, the authority is on his shoulders. Not ours. When Christ went to the cross, he paid the penalty for us. He fought our battle. He did the work on our behalf. This great salvation that we have, the light that dawns, that shines in the dark place. It's because of him. It's not that we have the light within ourselves. It's not that we conjure it up within ourselves. It's him. The life and the truth and the beauty and the joy. It comes as a gift. And it comes only those who are willing to receive the gift. Now, quite honestly, it takes humility to receive the gift. There's something in us that wants to fight our own battles. There's something in us that wants to earn it all for ourselves. There's something in it that doesn't want to admit our shortcomings. You see, when we come to the light, what we say is, my heart is evil and it's ignorant and I have no capacity to rescue myself. I need you. 
Now, some gifts are hard to accept. Can you imagine if your friend gave you a gift and it was a book and you open it up and it said overcoming selfishness? Now, my wife is laughing over here because one time I thought I was being a good husband. And I thought, I'm just going to, I don't know, help her. I, <laughs> so I got this book for her. The book had been a great encouragement to me. I like to study personalities. It'd make a great adult Bible class sometime, personalities. So I thought my wife would love to study personalities also. So I gave her a book called Personality Plus. Anybody see a problem? Oh, just one hand went up. She's like, what are you trying to tell me? I just thought you'd want to learn. It was helpful to me. I guess if I apologize, I'm sorry. I was out of line. There's never been a gift offered that takes more humility to receive than the gift of salvation. Because we have to admit that we're far more flawed than we ever imagined we would be. We're far darker than we ever want to admit. We're far more sinful than we want anybody to know. That takes humility. And quite honestly, the Bible described it as a narrow road because not everyone is ready to go that low. Not everyone is willing to be that humble. Christmas means we're lost, so unable to save ourselves that nothing less than the death of the Son of God himself could save us. You're not somebody who can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and save yourself. And neither am I. To accept the true Christmas gift means that we admit that we're a sinner and we've been saved by grace. It's pretty fascinating. Matthew 27 records um, the scene at the cross. And it's in verse 45. It was from the sixth hour to the ninth hour of the day. Sixth hour was noon to 3 p.m. There was darkness over the land. The death of Christ. And all that darkness over the land was so that we could find the light. And First Peter 2 and verse 9 describes us this way. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you would proclaim the praises of him, here it is, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's only one way out. For nations... There's only one way out for cultures, for communities, for families. And that is for individuals to humbly receive the gift. To receive it is to acknowledge we're far more sinful than we want anybody to know. But Christ is the light. And his death on the cross changes everything and makes it possible for us to come back into a right relationship with God. Would you bow your heads with me, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed. This darkness in the world is because of the darkness of the human heart. The darkness of the human heart has only one cure. 
the light of Christ. I wonder if you're here and you've spent a lot of time looking other places. Looking for other cures. And today you realize this is the answer I've been looking for. This is what I've been searching for all these years. It's Christ. If there's never been a time where you've given your life to Jesus Christ today would be a the perfect day to do it. Christmas time is the perfect time to do that. From your own heart to God's. Let God know that you're a sinner and that he already sees what you're admitting today, the dark side of your heart. And tell God from your heart to his, you know, Jesus Christ died for you, that he's the, the source of life and light. And you're calling on him. You might let him know that you're done fighting your own battles and trying to earn and prove your own worth. You're going to accept his gift of eternal life. Let him know that. Maybe express your gratitude for him doing that. Unto us a son is given. God, what a gift you gave. If you're here and you prayed that way, you'd never prayed that way before. But you prayed to. The Bible calls it being saved to admit your own darkness and find your light and life in Christ. You'd never done that before, but you did today. I wonder if you just slip your hand up. No one's looking around, but between you, me and the Lord. You'd say, I prayed that prayer just now. I prayed to receive Christ into my life. Thank you. Who else would say I've prayed that way to be saved? God in heaven. For all of us here today. Would you forgive us for all the times we try to. Fight our own battles and find our meaning, our satisfaction, our identity in something other than you. Thank you that all of the responsibility, all the burden, all the weight went on to the shoulders of Christ. And even in our darkness, we have a place to look. The light of Christ. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.